Hello and welcome to this Kurtzman Publishing Talk on Balclutha Mansion, a mansion house built in the west end of Greenock. My name is Vincent Gillen and today I will be telling you about the house and its owners over the years. The house was commissioned in 1860 by James Morton, originally from Schotts, who had come to Greenock and acquired the Greenock Iron Works in 1848. With the success of the company, he could afford to build a grand house, and Belclutha was certainly grand. The architects were Glasgow firm of Butcher and Cowsland, and the very large house was built in an Italian style. As you can see from this map, the house was built in a row of plots just off New Ark Street in Greenock. The three neighbouring houses were also designed by Butcher and Cowsland, Dungourney, Bel Air and the Craigs. Dungourney, commissioned by Newfoundland firm owner James McBride and later owned by James Brown, the managing director of Scots, then Colin S. Caird, then Mackay's the Bakers. Bel Air was built for David Johnson of the Guru Rotework Company and then owned by James Tennant Caird. The Craigs was the first of the three built by the firm of Cowsland and Butcher and was owned by the Cuthberts who were a shipbuilding company or a ship owning company and then owned by the Shanklins also a ship owning company. Next along is Stone Lee, built for a Mr Cowan, who was a sugar refiner, and then owned by another Caird, Arthur Caird. It was designed by Honeyman. So at one time, Bel Air, Dungourney and Stone Lee were all owned by members of the Caird family. And finally on this uh, set of plots was Lindor's previously known as Nellie's Lee, which was designed by uh, Honeyman and made for Mr Mason, another sugar refiner in town. Another piece of work by the Butcher and Cowsland architects was the Greenock Club, now the Cedar School on Argown Square. James Morton was provost of Greenock from 1868 to 1871. He was a liberal and also a patron of the Working Boys and Girls Religious Society. Here are a couple of clippings from the Greenock Telegraph about his politics. Uh, the recent liberal meeting in the Greenock Town Hall. Mr Morton of Balclutha, who presided at the meeting held in Town Hall last week, when Lord Rosebery addressed the people of Greenock, has forwarded to us copies of answers received from Mr Gladstone and Errol Granville in reply to resolutions unanimously passed at said meeting and duly forwarded. The replies are as follows. November the 8th, 1881. Sir, I am desired by Lord Granville to acknowledge with his best thanks the receipt of your letter of the 5th instant, enclosing copies of resolutions passed at a meeting called by the Greenock Liberal Association on the 3rd. I am, sir, yours, your obedient servant, Henry Harvey. James Morton, Esquire Greenock. Morton, alongside his brother-in-law, Robert Blair, had set up a, an early version of a building society in the East End to provide affordable homes. Uh, thus we see the Greenock Provident Investment Company uh, with an office at 3 Morton Terrace. Uh, this company didn't last very long, however. This is a lovely postcard of Morton Terrace, named after James Morton. Morton is very much a supporter of temperance, and in this he was patron of the Belclutha Cricket Club and the Morton Cl uh, Football Club, which were set up on temperance principles. He was a very religious individual, being a member of the Union, Union Street United Presbyterian and he taught at the Sabbath school. 
So just as today, uh, people who were interested in sport would try to get sponsors or patrons. And so we see um, adverts for a uh, field suitable for football wanted in the vicinity of the West End of Greenock and applied by letter to Alfred Morton, who was his son at Belclutha. Um, football Volunteers Tournament. The finalists in this tournament, Belclutha versus Belleville, met at Volunteer Park on Saturday before a large turnout. Both clubs were enthusiastically supported and a capital game was witnessed. Belleville were the aggressors in the first half, scoring a couple of goals early in the play, but Belclutha had their innings after, after crossing over and succeeded in drawing level. The result was two goals each. And here also are the fixtures for the Belclutha Cricket Club. As well as being involved in the iron trade, James Morton was a director of the Queen Insurance Company, selling fire and life insurance. This notice in the Telegraph of 1884 is a notice of the liquidation of the Greenock Iron Company. However, it does state that the, all the debts were paid for and that the new company set up as James Morton and Sons would include James, Alfred and Ernest, the sons of James Morton. All the debts seem to have been paid. In the same year as the liquidation, James, however, was struck by the disaster of his son dying suddenly. James was married to Janet, the daughter of the local banker, Thomas Stark, and he died aged 38. There's notice, the Provost said they would be all aware of the death of ex-Provost Morton's eldest son, which took place so suddenly. An opportunity was given to any of them to attend the funeral, which took place at three o'clock. He thought that they should endeavour not to protract, protract their meeting so as to enable those who desire to attend the funeral to do so. The invitations sent out were of a general kind, but as the funeral was to um, assume a semi-public character and the volunteers were going to be present, any gentleman who desired could go. He was sure they were they all deeply sympathised with Mr Morton and the deceased wife and family in their loss. This is a picture of Andrew C Morton and his family, the brother of James. And so it would appear that Balclutha was put up for sale in February 1884, uh, before the death of the son James. So I'm presuming that this was a, as a consequence of the of the liquidation of the company. So as you can see from these adverts, a full description of the house and uh, the furniture therein. However. Several months later, it was said that uh, the mansion house of Balclutha was just at the exposed to sale in Glasgow, but did not find a purchaser. So the Mortons seemed to have stayed there until the death of James in 1890. This is his obituary on the left and the memorial stone in Greenock. James Morton was certainly very well thought of. The next owner of Balclutha was Sir Charles Cameron. He took the name Balclutha when he was given a baronetcy in 1893. From 1864, he was the editor and from 1873, the proprietor of the North Britain Daily Mail in Glasgow. He was an MP for Glasgow from 1874 to 1885 and again from 1897 to 1900. He lived at Balclutha in the 1890s until the death of his wife in 1899. He then rented the house out. His wife died, as I said, in 1899, and her mausoleum in Greenock Cemetery is the only mausoleum in the cemetery and is an impressive structure. Sir Charles was uh, another liberal like James Morton. 
Mr John Cameron, Secretary to the Greenock Liberal Association, has received the following letter from Sir Charles Cameron in reply to one sent up by the Greenock Liberal Association, congratulating him on the honour which Her Majesty had conferred upon him. In other words, becoming a baronet. This is the obituary for Lady Cameron, who died in 1899, and this is her mausoleum in Greenock Cemetery. A very impressive structure. This is one of those interesting asides or rabbit holes that local history and genealogy send you down. This is regarding the HMS Condor and Commander Scalator. In connection with the absence of any intelligence regarding this vessel, which is now 31 days overdue from Eskimo to Honolulu, and the fact that, as notified in these columns yesterday, the gravest fears are entered in naval, naval circles regarding her safety, it appears from the latest Navy list that the Condor was captained by Ca Commander Clifton Sclater, who is well known to many Green Hill Keens. He having been stationed here about three years ago for a considerable period, whilst on the staff of HMS Benbow. During his sojourn in Greenock, Commander Sclater was engaged to the only daughter of Sir Charles Cameron, who was at that time residing at Balclutha, and the parties were afterwards married. Mrs Sclater, then Miss Frances Cameron, will be remembered by many as having taken part, along with her father, at many political and social functions in this town. On one occasion too, Mrs Sclater, who is a clever violinist, took a prominent part in a charity concert organised for the benefit of the local medical aid society, when a sum of about £40 was realised. The friends of Mrs Sclater and Greenock will doubtless extend much sympathy to her at such an anxious and painful juncture. HMS Condor is a screw sloop, launched in 1898, six guns, 980 tons, 1400 horsepower, speed 13 knots, on Pacific Station. HMS Condor was indeed lost. After the death of his wife, Sir Charles Cameron leased the house to a certain Robert McAlpine, the construction giant who founded Robert McAlpine, and which is still in business today. Born in 1847, having left school at the age of 10, he first went down the mines before becoming an apprentice bricklayer. Robert, known as Concrete Bob, was the first to use concrete for bridges and viaducts at the turn of the 20th century, having built the Glenfinnan viaduct of 21 arches in concrete. This notice in the Telegraph uh, accounts for a change in the stables at Balclutha saying that it will be probably turned into a motor house capable of accommodating at least five motors. Mr Robert McAlpine of Balclutha, who is an enthusiastic motist, owns no less than ten cars in different parts of the country, several of which are in Greenock. Uh, the cars shown are just examples and they're not Mr McAlpine. Sir Robert McAlpine, as he became, went on to greater and bigger things, moving to Wembley. As a result, Balclutha was put up for sale in around about 1910. The next owner of Balclutha was Robert Lyons Scott, who was born in Greenock in 1871 into a wealthy Scottish shipbuilding family. At the time, his father, J.C. Scott, was chairman and senior partner of the firm John Scott & Sons, which was the oldest shipbuilding company in Britain, having been established in 1711. RL was schooled at Wellington College and after intended to join the Royal Artillery, as his elder brother was being groomed to take control of the family firm. However, the Royal Artillery turned him down on account of his indifferent eyesight, and so it was that he became a director of Scots and remained there for the rest of his life. The Royal Artillery's decision has a degree of irony, as Scott was already an excellent game shot and was later to become a prominent big game hunter, 
as well as capturing Scotland's fencing team. Scott's elder brother died in 1915 and so the family shipbuilding mantle was placed entirely on his shoulders. This furthered his already considerable wealth by some margin, and so it was, once the Great War had ended, that he was able to secure many items of historic importance that were being sold to help families who had lost their heirs and therefore their future. It should be noted that Scott was one of the few people nationally who could compete at a financial level with the new money in America. If it had not been for him, then many items of national importance would have crossed the ocean. On the following slides, you will see some images of uh, Scott's shipyards and R.L. Scott. This is a view of the Scott Shipbuilding and Engineering Company at Cartsburn. This is RL, second from the right, I think, with the Swires and Holtz. Again, RL, second from the right at a Launch. And again, a uh, party at the launch. At Scott's um, RL was fifth from the left in the light grey. Uh, here are a selection of letters from RL Scott that he'd written to his mother and father uh, while on a trip to the Far East. My dear father, I have been having a very good time here. Everyone has been very hospitable and kind and I have been tiffining and dining almost every day with someone or another. It seems to be a very good thing here to be a nephew of J.H. Scott and not bad to be connected with his uh, Swire and Company. I have been twice to the refinery and spent all day there yesterday. It certainly is a wonderful establishment and full of Greenock men. They tell, they tell me they hold Greenock Fair there every year. I hope to put in another day there when I get back here. The day before I spent at the Kowloon Dock Company and found the Centurion in Dock, Old Gillies, the manager, took, took me all over himself and it is a fine place and extending very much. They are building a few small steamers and barges, besides those on for B and S. Their big dock is a very fine one and the powerful was in it last week. I was introduced to Captain Jellicoe of the Centurion who gives the engines great praise. I am going on Saturday to Monday with Grey and others in a, in a houseboat to shoot probably in the Canton River. They say there is nothing to shoot, but we will have a good walk. I am getting knickerbockers and boots made of, ch made by Chinamen. On Monday I am going to Canton and from there up the West River, which will take about 8 to 10 days. And we'll be back here before New Year. After that I am going, probably with Dowlin and Robertson, his wife and his wife, over to Macau, Macau for a night to see the... Uh, Fantan gambling? They tell me that here I ought to go to see Manila, but it means six days at sea and a certain um, and a certain dusting in a small steamer for about two or three days there, and I don't know that is worthwhile. None of my movements are of course fi fixed, but I enclose a rough outline as far as Japan. I have written to the master, Frank and Charles. I hope you have been having some days at, I'm not sure what that says, your affectionate son, Robert Scott. And so we see that, uh, the menu from his time on the Kobe Maru, the Nippon, uh, or the Japanese ship that he was on. And a picture 
of the launch of the SS Menelaus in 1895 with his father, John Scott IV, on the right, along with Afro Alfred Holt, John Swire, and his brother C.C. C. Scott. These, uh, this is the, the Hong Kong Dockyard Company and the sugar refinery that Ariel was talking about in his letters. The refinery was built by uh, the Greenock Company, Blake and Bartley, and the dockyard was constructed by Scots or his uncle. So, using his connections and the family connections and business connections. This is his uncle J. H. Scott at Swire and Co. So you can see from the letterheads here that his journey continued from Hong Kong and Japan over to America. And in these letters he's writing to his mother. This is uh, at the Kyoto Hotel in Kyoto. My dear mother arrived at Kobe early on Tuesday morning and stayed till the next day when I came on here by train. And other bits of news. R.L. Scott was a very keen game shot and from this he developed an interest in big game hunting. He travelled the world on various safaris including six made to Africa where he employed the services of Richard John Cunningham known usually as R.J. Cunningham's reputation went before him and Scott was determined that he should lead his first African safari. Scott was also a, mention of, uh, a member of the Shikar Club. In 1909, the legendary hunter Frederick Courtney Sellew, together with P.B. Vanderbilt and Charles Radcliffe, created an institution that epitomised all that was admirable about empire, and one that has lasted into the 21st century, the Shikar Club. It was on the 7th of June at the Café Royal, Regent Street in London, when over 70 of the most well-known sporting figures of their day met at an inaugural dinner to found the Shikar Club, which was to promote specifically the hunting and shooting pursuits of the day. The Earl of Lonsdale chaired this meeting and followed dinner and following dinner a committee was established to draft a constitution for the club. The Shikar Club promoted international shooting competitions which were centred around big game hunting and at every opportunity courageous feats and acts of valour by the members were feted in the context of danger and adventure against the backdrop of honour and fair play. Club members comprised many aristocrats and high-ranking military men of the calibre of Sir Claude de Crespigny, who was ready to box, ride, walk, run, shoot, fence, sail or swim with anyone over 50 on equal terms. The club's constitution recognises and reinforces the virtues of fair play and duty, as defined by its mostly upper-class membership. The following pages show R.L. Scott and R.J. hunting in Africa. Of course, this is completely abhorrent to us now as a, as a pastime, but it certainly shines a light on the social life and the world views of the industrial elite at this time. This is R.L. Scott uh, standing over one of his trophies and his friend R.J. Cunningham standing over one of his trophies. Buckluther became the trophy room for this, his collection of animals that he'd bagged on safari. And as I said, this of course is looked on now as an abhorrent practice, but it was of its time.
I'm not sure if uh, anyone nowadays would have their, their house um, decorated in such a fashion, but I think you can tell it was a, a bachelor's pad. Again, quite a sickening sight, but a lesson, I suppose, for those who came after. This was a costly exercise, of course, so again, only the very rich could do this kind of thing. And it shows just uh, how up there Ariel Scott was. Not sure if this, this is the same rhinoceros that uh, RJ shot and they've just turned it turned it round the other way or Scott stood on the other side. But it certainly, it certainly allow, lets you think about the man in a different light, doesn't it? We don't exactly look at him with fondness. Of course, the interesting thing apart in these photographs, apart from uh, the trophies on the wall, is the architecture and the interior design of Balclutha. The 1930s brought the depression and the Scottish shipyards suffered terribly as a result. Scots could see, Scott Ariel could see the Clyde from his family home, Balclutha, and showed his philanthropic nature by electing not to take his chairman's salary, but instead to share it out amongst key members of his staff, thus ensuring the survival of the firm. However, his final and greatest act of philanthropy was to follow his death. And so we can see the Maclean Museum, Following his uh, death, he bequeathed his collection of heads to the museum. Uh, some of these are still on display, but the majority are either gone or or uh, in store. I think a lot of them would have been been uh, used or used would be stuffed using arsenic, so therefore uh, very dangerous. But what a view of the museum! The catalogue covers a lifetime of hunting from 1908 through to 1938, representing in his collection of mounted heads and specimens of animals and fish. Collected on numerous trips to Norway, Northwest Rhodesia, the Sudan, India, Mexico, Trinidad, Nigeria, Kenya, Canada, Czechoslovakia, basically wherever he went, he shot something. He lists the species, date, shot, caught, locality and measurements and includes a lion, tiger, buffalo, rhino, numerous deer species, ibex, plains, game, tarpon, uh, and just a repeat of uh, director of uh, Scots and Greenock, and he donated to the Maclean Museum and Art Gallery this collection on his death in 1939. Ariel Scott was an innately modest man, apparently, shy and somewhat withdrawn by nature, who, by the time of his death, had amassed a collection of arms and armour of such importance that it rivalled those of William Wallace, the Fitzwilliam Museum and the Royal Armouries. He became an expert in his field, and his collection was so complete and important, in part because he knew and understood exactly what he was buying. In many cases, the items he secured, especially armour, had been on his list for years. His bequest was that his collection, the most considerable in private hands at that time, be given to the city of Glasgow and her people. Even Sir William Burrow, the other well-known benefactor of Glasgow, and also a shipbuilder, 
was moved to say that the Scott bequest is the most significant thing of its kind to have happened in Scotland since the foundation of this municipal collection. I wonder what would have happened if it had been the other way around and the arms and armour came to the Maclean and the, the hunting collection went to Glasgow. Hmm, interesting. His library also went to Glasgow Museums, which has a collection of over 3,000 books and manuscripts, which date from between 1291 and 1936. This exceptional collection, one of three of the most comprehensive collections of its kind in the world, deals with all aspects of military theory and practice, from fencing, cavalry and artillery, to unarmed combat and hunting. It ranges from a manuscript folio relating to a tournament at Senlis or Senlis in France in 1291 to a scholarly work on fencing dating from 1936. Some of the earliest books include those by the German 14th century fight master Johannes Lichtenauer, writings of the Roman military tacticians Frontinus, Aelianus and Vegetius are also represented from the 15th century onwards. The great European Renaissance theorists and practitioners of swordsmanship are remarkably and comprehensively represented in many first editions, with one book by Manciolino, the first to be published in Italian in 1531. On the right are some specially commissioned rifles that he bought for himself and uh, R.J. Cunningham. The following slides again show the interiors of Baclutha, but uh, highlighting the arms and armour. Again, quite an interesting way of displaying your hobbies or your collections. I love that elephant's head coming out of the come out of the wall in front of all the uh, suits of armour and pole axes, etc. So again, if you go to Kelvin Grove, you will see uh, the collection or the Scott collection displayed in a very different manner from which Scott himself displayed his collection. Ariel Scott had spent much of 1938 confined to his house with an illness that ultimately was to claim him. A trip was made to South Africa to recuperate and apparently feeling rather better, he returned home the following year to accept an appointment from the Prime Minister as a trustee of the Wallace Collection. However, he contracted a summer chill and died, seated in his favourite chair at home on the 5th of July 1939. The next role for Balglutha was when the Admiralty bought it I and mean, it was used as a hostel for wrens and other uh, forces that were in Greenock at this time. On the left is a newspaper article just saying that there was a a, a, a fire at Belclutha on Newark Street in one of the outhouses and the wrens there helped keep the fire in check. The next chapter in the story of Balclutha starts in 1955 when the Admiralty sold the mansion to the local authorities who demolished it with a plan to build houses on the site, much as had been done at Stonely. A new project however came to prominence. This was how to replace the old academy on Nelson Street shown here, while also finding a place for the new James Watt College which would be built on the site of the old academy. The old Greenock Academy was a spectacular building. 
Built in 1855, it had, however, seen its best days. This photograph shows the, the C Company of the First Royal Renfrewshire Volunteers. The volunteers used Academy Park as uh, its home location and where it uh, had all its parades. The next few slides are photographs of staff and children at the old academy on Nelson Street. This is a view of the somewhat formidable staff in 1955. It's a lovely shot of an infant class. Happy weasels, most of them. And I presume this is the groups of prefects at the academy in front of the old uh, building main entrance. This is a ground plan showing the development of the school since 1855 and it is quite clear that buildings had grown up over the years and that they were in separate locations throughout the site. So the need to build a new school was paramount and so we see the clearance of the site that would become the new Gunuk Academy. So in the middle of the picture, you see Glen Park, and on the left is the cleared site of Balclutha. This newspaper cutting talks about the new academy being ready in 1963. The Dean of Guild Court last week pushed plan, uh, passed plans for the new Greenock Academy, which will be built at a cost of 360,000. Furnishings will cost an additional 150,000. The school, which will occupy 50,000 square feet, is to be erected on a site formerly occupied by Balclutha, the mansion home of the, the late R. L. Scott, and will be bounded by Finnert Street, Madeira Street and Newark Street. And here we have the new school in situ. And so we come to the final chapter in the story of Balclutha. Emmerclay Council embarked on an ambitious programme of school building, the result being that Greenwich Academy was moved to the new school, the Clyde View. In the meantime, the old school was used as a film set for the series Waterloo Road. Finally, in 2015, the old school buildings were demolished. The site has lain empty for the last nine years, apart from the Glen Park Early Learning Centre, which was built in 2018. It was announced in 2024 that 30 homes are being built for CCG Homes at the former Greenock Academy site. The development, marketed as the Scholars, will consist of 24 terraced villas and six terraced houses. And so we have come to the end of the story of Balclutha, the house, the site and its occupants. I hope you've enjoyed the talk. Please get in touch or please leave a comment.